So hi everyone, welcome to the uh, Saturday night Aquarian, uh, Aquarian series of the United Lodge of the Asphists out of San Diego. So tonight we will be uh, listening to a talk on self-magnetization uh, given by Dr. Elton Hall. And um, you're welcome to join our series. If you haven't already, you can sign up on the San Diego website. Our presenter, Dr. Elton Hall. Okay, yes. thank you. These thoughts are those of a student, and they cannot be more than a student's point of view. As will be clear, anything of worth in what follows comes from Raghavan Iyer's theosophical teaching on the subject. Helena Blavatsky tells us in The Secret Doctrine that Fohat is a most mysterious force. On the one hand, it hardens the atoms, and in the contemporary theory and language of physics, this suggests both the strong and weak nuclear forces that hold atoms together and allows the formations of molecules from which all phenomenal nature arises. But it also seems to be the electromagnetic force that gives us the power to light our houses and communicate over vast differences. On the other hand, H.V.B. says that Fohat gives rise to Mahat, the source of mind and consciousness. On the physical level, we know that the body uses bioelectricity for brain functioning, as well as the work of the nervous system and the heart, indeed, the whole physical body. So this mysterious power called Fohat, operative on all levels of existence, on all seven cosmic and human principles is the driving power of everything in the worlds of becoming. Without Fohat, there would be no cohesion, no consciousness, nothing. All this suggests that Fohat in its many forms on many levels of existence must be relevant to the pilgrimage of humanity as a whole and to individuals who aspire to tread the Bodhisattva path, as well as the path to Nirvana, which the great master called an exalted selfishness, and even the path to black magic and self-destruction. In this sense, Fohat is neutral, and it is consciousness that makes its power serve evil or good. The physical electromagnetism we experience when releasing power for human activity like walking and thinking, is, of course, only the grossest manifestation of the mystery of Fohat, not even fully understood on the physical plane. The third object of, the theosophical, <clears throat> of all theosophical societies and groups is the discovery of the powers latent in humanity. And all these powers are manifestations of Fohat, indeed, of Fohotic forces within Fohotic forces. Self-magnetization is the application of that mysterious force in service of treading the path. The leading Hermes quotation in the Aquarian Almanac for the week of August 19th, 2023, sums up a fundamental element of that path. Quote, by the power of thought, one can enable what is in the higher vestures to act magnetically upon the lower vestures. The other quotations to the week fill out the meaning of this profound insight. Self-magnetization is intimately linked to self-purification. In Raghavan Iyer's The Fires of Creation, in volume one of the Gupta Vidya, we are told, quote, the ancients gave great importance to electricity in its relation to self-purification through self-magnetization. This has to do not merely with physical hygiene, but with all modes of pollution and cleanliness affecting the body, brain, and heart. 
many people instinctively feel a wish to bathe after various kinds of debasing encounters. But one cannot produce a metaphysically and karmically purifying result through physical means alone. Nevertheless, if the abstract is made the basis of the external through meditation, then spiritual knowledge and devotion can purify one's nature from within without, from above below. Such a rich and dense passage raises many questions. What is this electricity and magnetization referred to? What pollution affects brain and heart? How does spiritual knowledge and devotion purify? What is it to purify from within without, from above below? The voice of the silence does not speak directly about self-magnetization, but it does talk of purification. It can be seen as a manual for spiritual aspiration and advancement. Importantly, this sacred text begins by saying that the instructions given are for those ignorant of the lower idi, the lower powers of mind, heart, and body that human beings are capable of developing, as indicated in the third object of theosophical societies. Both the third object and the voice declare that the human being is plastic in mind and body. Neuroscientists have discovered that the brain can modify itself even in old age. And this suggests that it can be made porous to divine ideation, more universal thoughts. H.P. Blavatsky in the Almanac quote for August 20th says, quote, learn how to adapt your thoughts and ideas to your plastic potency. And B.P. Wadia adds, the intimacy between the divine ego and the human personality is not established in the man of flesh till the neophyte learns to evoke by purity, sacrifice, and control the power and the radiance of divinity. That divinity is one's real self, and we must evoke it if we are to develop into the spiritual being that is possible in incarnation into the lower vestures, including the physical body. <clears throat> but the voice does not give a step-by-step -step explanation of how to achieve a purified mind and body, unlike the directions for assembling a piece of furniture that arrives in a box. The reason for this is given by Raghavan Iyer in God's Monads and Atoms in the first volume of the Gupta Vidya. Quote, Self-conscious human beings have deliberately to provide for themselves their own means, not merely of protection, but even more of beneficent reaching out to others and warding off without any ill will toward the source of pollution, all those influences that are unwholesome. This requires a high degree of self-knowledge. Perhaps the simplest way in which any person could begin is to start with the idea of self-magnetization. So the voice tells us what is to be done and what to avoid, but cannot tell us in detail how to do it. The path to perfection is different for each individual. And the voice tells us that we cannot travel on that path until we become the path itself. Self-magnetization is the beginning of our effort to enter the path, and it is part of every step on that path. Every human being exists within a magnetic field. On the physical level, this can be measured, and experiments have shown that the physical magnetic field varies with one's mood, attitude, propensities, and therefore thinking. In the 1970s, experiment experimenters set up an electromagnetic field generator. In a room of generally happy people, they set the generator to a level that they had detected with depressed individuals. Within minutes, the previously gay and talkative group became quiet and even sullen. Similarly, when a happy setting was used, a group of rather depressed people became lighter and more talkative. 
All this was, of course, merely at the physical level. One can only imagine what must occur on deeper levels of magnetization. Since we each have a magnetic field, the interaction of that field is important for both us and for those with whom we come in contact. Raghavan Iyer said, to create a particular kind of field, it is crucial to do only those things which are compatible with that field. Most people are not ready for this, but if a person does come to this stage, certainly those changes in life would have to be made which move the plane of struggle altogether from the visible realm to much subtler and deeper aspects of the psyche and the mind affecting st states of consciousness experienced in dream and deep sleep. This quotation points to the breadth and depth of magnetization. No field generator can fundamentally alter our magnetic being. We have to do that on our own, and it takes consistent effort to do this, for much more than one's physical body is involved. In addition to the astral form, which will have to be cleansed of the detritus it has collected, every aspect of consciousness will have to be reformed. This means what we think, and of course what we say and do, will have to be oriented toward our spiritual nature. No wonder Raghavan Iyer said that most are not yet ready for this level of transformation. Yet we begin where we are and we can initiate consciously chosen changes that lead to a fundamental reformation of our being and of our magnetic field, a field that uplifts everything that comes within its reach. Even though the voice does not speak directly of magnetization, it provides the guidance necessary for this transformation. The voice begins by giving a broad view of what lies ahead for the aspirant, we began in the Hall of Ignorance and moved to the Hall of Learning, where many of us are today. We are warned that it is filled with attractive and alluring distractions, each of which contains a poisonous serpent. These serpents symbolize the ways we are diverted by ourselves with our attractions, repulsions, propensities, and illusory ideas from even approaching the path which is ourselves the divinity within. The voice points to the hall of wisdom and the waters of immortality which lie beyond. After giving this broad brush overview, the voice provides the first vital step, which is also the crucial step at each stage in spiritual development. To live to benefit mankind is the first step. To practice the six glorious virtues is the second. As Raghavan Iyer says in self-magnetization, instead of consigning oneself to the captivity of psychological delusions and temporal illusions through moribund attachment to fleeting forms, one must renounce separative and self-limiting life. Then one can enjoy the pulse of universal life. This starting point of living to benefit mankind is tremendous and cannot but distress the unprepared individual. It expresses a complete change of consciousness, a reorientation of one's whole being, turning at once outward and upward, the paradigm of from within without and from above below. One might see this as a paradox. We are to withdraw from involvement in the world, yet reach out to the whole of humanity. But it is not a paradox. If we are to grow in spiritual thought and action, we must withdraw from that which distracts, indeed pollutes, us precisely, so we can reach out to humanity from a level that is more real than petty interactions can ever be. We cannot do this unless we seek out our true nature, which is above, <coughs> and bring it to bear without. Hence, both mind and heart, manas and buddhi, are involved. The quotation for August 26th from Guru Nanak, the founder of the Sikh tradition, says, 
In thy heart's garden plant like seeds, the word of the guru. The teacher, who is both within and without, cannot tread the path for any of us. But his teaching, which, if authentic, is always a manifestation of the word, can invariably help us if we take the teaching to heart. The reorientation of consciousness expressed in the powerful statement, to live to benefit mankind is the first step, is a fundamental teaching of self-magnetization. It says the I, or ego, which, with which we identify is not us, but merely an instrument that we use to act in the world. The carpenter's saw is a tool, not the carpenter or his or her skill. The saw on its own does nothing. The carpenter does the work. But someone who never saw the carpenter, but only the saw at work, might think the saw by itself plans and remains true to the cut. The phenomenal ego is a tool, not the real being. We ultimately are nor even the powers we have, though many of them lie latent and unused within us. If we identify with the I, we miss the true self and think the ego is doing everything. Left to itself without direction from our higher nature, it will carve a swath through life that has little or nothing to do with anything ultimately meaningful. We need to develop the skills to direct the phenomenal eye to real spiritual work. And the voice shows us what that is. Self-magnetization is fundamental to the development of those skills, for it is crucial to reorienting ourselves to serve humanity, itself crucial to avoiding the serpents in the hall of learning. Without that reorientation, Learning and nurturing the powers latent in each human being only leads to greater selfishness and darkness. The sense of separateness from others and the whole of existence is not a fundamental feature of cosmic descent into manifestation or of human rebirth into a body. The one life, which is the great breath, manifests in diversity, but that diversity is myopic in comparison to it. As the one light, it is beyond even the distinction between spirit and matter. As Raghavan Iyer states in Self-Magnetization in Volume 3 of the Gupta Vidya. As the voice warns, the dire heresy of separateness prevents the full and proper development of the human being. Our task is to rise beyond that heresy, which exists at every level of our being, until overcome by perfectly living to serve humanity. Since humans have spent lifetimes pursuing wants and desires, sometimes even playing a zero-sum game of desire fulfillment against others with wants and desires, it takes great and continuous effort to overcome the illusions humans have created for themselves. The first step to live to benefit mankind is a continuous first step that pervades all efforts to incarnate one's true nature into daily life. The six glorious virtues, the paramitas, six and ten in number, are the beginning of such development. And they eventually are the portals through which one must pass on the bodhisattva path. While we tend to consider these virtues as ethical principles, and they are that, they are even more the developed features of consciousness, for it is consciousness that is transformative. Typically distracted and scattered thought is hardly consciousness at all. Raghavan Iyer points to ideation, which is manas lighted by buddhi, which is genuinely creative and therefore transformative. Hence the call to meditation, not on the personal self and its joys and sorrows, but on the highest one can discern, the atmic light in all beings. From fellow human beings to the smallest subatomic particle and to the cosmos as a whole. 
Recall that the word virtue comes from the Latin vis, which means power, not some culturally determined moral rule. The Latin word <clears throat> for a true man, vir, related to vis and distinct from the mere human, homo, is associated with heroes, and bodhisattvas are the unsurpassed heroes of humanity. Paramita, often translated virtue, literally means that which carries one beyond. We get missive and missile from the same root. So while we can start with dana, literally giving, from which we get donation, dana means much more than that. As a portal, it is called the key to charity and love immortal. We may write a check to help someone with, or help someone with the laundry, but when more fully realized in one's consciousness, dana is a condition where one helps others without even thinking about it. It has just become one's nature, like breathing, such that one is not even aware that one is engaged in it. The same depth of meanings reside in all the paramitas. Think of viraga, not even listed as a paramita among the six, because it is the fulcrum, according to B.P. Wadia, on which the others rest, the first three generally looking outward, the second three more focused within. Even here, the centrifugal and centripetal aspects of evolution are reflected. Imagine Viraga as indifference to pleasure and to pain, illusion conquered, truth alone perceived. At one level, Viraga is critical distance, discernment unclouded by prejudice, propensities, attractions, and repulsions. More deeply, it is lack of concern with anything the world and karma offer. Imagine the stance, that stance, as being as natural as breathing. Even a little reflection shows that, as is true of all cycles, cosmic and human, our introduction to the paramitas foreshadows their ultimate meaning, where each portal is a complete transformation of the individual who is crossing them, <coughs> who in crossing them is ever drawing nearer to the one light, the one life beyond all its myopic reflections in the diversity of existence. As one begins to realize the paramitas at ever subtler levels, moving beyond intellectual ascent to real assimilation, such that they increasingly characterize one's being in incarnation, one also increasingly realizes just how utterly inter interdependent one is on the whole of humanity and all nature. One owes the privilege of being in a body, the four lower vestures or principles, to the Bahashad Petris, who sacrificially evolved a form that can hold self-consciousness, and one owes that remarkable consciousness to the Agnishvata Petris, who sacrificed of themselves to light it up for us. Even at the most mundane level, we are dependent on plants and animals and on farmers and producers and merchants and on fire and water and so on and on for our existence. We can see why Raghavan Iyer in his essay, Self-Magnetization, turns attention to the importance of gratitude. Imagine breathing gratitude without having to bring it to deliberative consciousness. So there are unmentioned paramitas, or perhaps we should say unmentioned virtues because they arise from the practice of those named. Sheila, for example, literally means conduct, but is more than moral rules or even ethical principles. It is the key of harmony in word and deed, the key that counterbalances the cause and the effect and leaves no room for karmic action. Karma is the law of restoration of balance, that perfect harmony called ritta at the cosmic level and karmaless action at the human level. The Bhagavad Gita has much to say about such action where everything done is offered to Krishna. Sheila then, intimates many so-called virtues, including gratitude, that are involved in becoming the path that one treads. It is the path of complete and unqualified selflessness, 
the fulfillment of the first step and its expansion to the whole of existence. As we are taught, there are those, sometimes called masters, sometimes the Brotherhood of Bodhisattvas, and many other names, who have trodden this path and have crossed the portals. Each such being is part of the great sacrifice, which allow us the privilege and sacred duty of doing our part, whatever that is, and dependent on our current inner and outer circumstances, to uplift the whole of humanity, and thereby the whole of existence. Thus we have been taught, and we are invited to take it to heart, not just as an intellectual system of thought, but as the promise of our whole being, dissolving the mind, manas, in the heart, buddhi, in the powerful words of Sri Shankaracharya. We can do no better than close with the words of Raghavan Iyer. As one becomes profoundly moved by the great sacrifice, one is able to make each day count more as a contribution in a life count well lived. At the moment of death, one will recognize that one has brought a golden thread of gratitude from the first moment of birth to a state that resembles death, but merely is a prelude to rebirth, a preface to the resumption of one's true vesture, wherein, self-consciously, one can return to the world to serve on behalf of all that breathes. May we be worthy of the teaching. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any uh, thoughts, questions, feedback? Okay, I see Robert Moore. Yeah, uh, Elton, one of uh, the teachings that we find in Theosophy and certainly was reiterated many, reiterated many times by Raghavan is the ability to carry a thought through sleep into waking the next morning. So I wondered if, if you had any comments about that idea in relation to self magnetization and how it connects with the paramitas. Ah. Well, he spoke a great deal about continuity of consciousness. One of the, one of the suggestions, of course, was that <clears throat> the way we so easily get distracted, what the Buddhists called the monkey mind, leaping from this to this, like turning away from dislikes and all of that, all underwritten by predispositions we have developed over lifetimes, no doubt, uh, undercuts the continuity of consciousness that is implied by meditation, and must exist in deep, dreamless sleep. And so that going to bed, going to sleep with a particular thought in mind, a lofty thought, uh, like to live to benefit mankind is the first step, is one I often use. Um, and then trying to wake up with that being kind of the first thought one has, begins to develop that continuity. That, to me, is just part of uh, self-magnetization, the attempt by one's efforts to purify one's field so that it has a positive rather than a negative or indifferent uh, effect on oneself and others. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks a lot for all of your reflections.
thank you. So Jim and Michelle are next, and then Sandra. Um, yes. Um, thank you, El Elton, for a wonderful, thoughtful <laughs> reflections that just are so distilled so beautifully and integrated. Um, now, I wonder, isn't it St. Paul that talks about uh, um, you need to come ye out and be ye separate? Uh, yes, it was. Okay, now, I'm, I'm wondering here, you, it, it, when one thinks about this, clearly it's not talking about emphasizing your separateness from other people. So come ye out and be ye separate. Now, it seems to me that that, could have some implications for the idea of self-magnetization. Um, in other words, um, in what sense do we come out and be separate from the crowd or from any other kind of consideration? Um, does this have implications or possible possible implications for the notion of self-magnetization? And just to give you further, just not, not this is a separate kind of question, but it might be related. I'm also interested in the question about in the Bible where where Jesus is touched by someone, his hem is touched, and he says, the virtue has been drained out of me. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, the, both of these are kind of thoughts, questions I have. How do we understand, come you out and be you separate? And the notion of the virtue being drained out of you, and it does it have anything about, does it also connect up to Jesus going into the hills to regenerate himself? separating himself from the crowd at night, so to speak. So take anyone you wish. <laughs> of, <laughs> that I have. Sorry, I just get all these questions came to mind. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I've thought off and on quite a bit about actually those passages. If you go back to the, in St. Paul, where he talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Mm -hmm. uh, a kind of self-conscious death and rebirth. He's speaking there of <clears throat> allowing the Christos you know, to enter one, where one becomes then a servant of the Christos. But the Christos is in over all so the come out coming out and being separate is coming out from all the distractions we put on ourselves and on one another in just our daily life. Think of how uh, chelas are often told, you know, to the degree possible, don't go into big crowds of people. Uh, that's not because there's something wrong with people. It's because you have all those conflicting, so to speak, magnetic forces that will just decloud whatever one is trying to be and do and see. But if one is really doing this, one discovers, of course, a much deeper connection with other people. And that will show up when encountering someone, being able to genuinely listen, and hear what they're saying, feel what they're thinking and feeling, and being able to respond in a way that is genuinely helpful, rather than saying something bland like, well, in my experience, or if I were you, I would, and so on, all the things that we tend to do because we don't really know what to say, because we don't really understand the needs of the person at that moment that we're talking to. So it's like you're establishing a deeper connection, hmm. and that's a magnetic <clears throat> connection, among others, um, with people, even as you, at some level, seem to separate yourself from it. And it seems to make perfectly good sense, just like every night we have to go to sleep, and we have to pass through dreams and go into that deep sleep state to restore ourselves for another day. Uh, so of course, if you were someone like Jesus, retiring to the desert for a period of time makes perfectly good sense for restoration. 
in the case of touching the hem of the garment, I have never been quite sure quite what to make of that, except that he, his, he was so aware that when his field was impinged on, he instantly knew it without having to directly perceive it. That's the only sense I can make of that just off the top of my head. Did it have anything to do with the prana? The uh, very likely prana is affected. I guess I'm kind of glad tonight's topic wasn't prana, which itself is a big mystery, because in some sense, it is a it is the universal reflection mm -hmm. at some level of the atmic light because it is shared by all and owned by none. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it passes kind of through us. And so its movement, I would think, would be kind of, uh, 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 would be detected by one who developed that level of sensitivity to the magnetic field or the pranic field, however you want to talk about it. Thank you, Alton. Thank you. I think I saw Sandra have a hand up. Sandra, can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is gone. Okay. Do we have any other questions? David. Oh, anyone start? Hi there, Elton. Hi to you. Could you say anything about um, the aspect of will in relation to magnetism? Ah, uh, and 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 maybe along with that, just a few other terms I might throw out that uh, I think relate to it. Maybe often on the receiving end are the, th uh, the terms enchantment, spell. Glamour. Could you, anyway, speak maybe to those? In, in uh, thinking of the. No, go ahead. No, the, 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 that's pretty much it. HPB talks about those things a lot in relation to uh, magnetism, with uh, hypnotism, for example, and and how we affect and are affected, and and she even uses. She says it's hard in English. There's not a word, so we use the word will, but yeah. that that is uh, certainly uh, has to do with the type of magnetic power, maybe of right. a very high order. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, will is a difficult word. Glamour came to mind, thinking of right. the hall of learning, because it is glamorous in the especially the uh, 19th century sense of that word um, we find ourselves attracted to things this is due to our past lives we find ourselves repelled by things due to past lives um, when William Kwan Judge on occasion spoke said you know behind will stands desire, mm -hmm. one can think clear back to the Rig Vedic hymn to creation. Kama, desire first arose in it. Now, kama is a very rich word and can have many meanings, but it's often translated that way. Desire first arose in it. Um, The whole of the Mahamanvantra is the urge to manifest, but it's also the urge to recollect. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that the human will is only as strong as the desires are united and focused. And we find people in which they can be focused very narrowly and selfishly, and they often are very willful. They have strong wills, but one can easily well also see that there are 
people whose vision is more universal and they too have strong will. Uh, so it seems to me that <clears throat> what we call the will is very dependent upon <clears throat> um, what we desire. Do we desire the truth? As in the phrase, there is no religion higher than truth. Do we desire the one life? Do we desire our own higher nature? Or do we desire whatever happens to come in front of us, you know, be it the donut in the donut shop or uh, anything else? Um, so that it's got, to, and that's closely tied, it seems to me, with all that talk of the continuity of consciousness. And I think that's tied and is partly a result of the generation of gratitude as it was spoken of in, in the article self-magnetization and we made brief reference to tonight. So you're thinking that these various terms somehow connect. I can't pretend to connect them all very well at this moment, but I'm absolutely convinced, yes, they are all connected. Thank you, David Shoba. Yeah, hi, Elton, that was beautiful. Uh, I just w w remember you talking about Fohat right in the beginning. So could we say that that plays a very crucial role in the self-magnetization and how? It's an expression of Fohat. I'm inclined to think, since Fohat is behind consciousness as well as what we call material existence, um, that will is probably an expression of that Fohatic energy in ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it's closely tied up, it seems to me, with self-magnetization, because mm -hmm. that's going to require a lot of quite deliberate and focused, so to speak, willpower on our part. And we have it because we can generate. It. We know we can generate it because we do regarding various things. Um, you know, decide to get an advanced degree, decide to become a nuclear physicist. You know, decide to become a lawyer. All these things take a great deal of uh, willpower to stick with them. And uh, so we know, you know, we have it. It's just how we're using it and how we're directing it. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you, Shoba. Good to see you. <laughs> Thank you, so uh, Jim, you had another thought? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering now, Elton, um, when thinking about self-magnetization, um, does it, is there another way of looking at this saying one has to withdraw, be very selective about one, what looks at, one touches, one listens to, all the senses are involved in in self-restraint and self-magnetization, you would think. But is there a sense in which when one does that, but with what Robert was talking about, you're talking about, but your purity of your motive, right? You were stressing that a lot in the talk because it seems to me that that connects up with Fohat. So if, if you have yes. purity of motive and then all of your senses now are being subject to discriminative involvement or withdrawal. Um, and so... Um, is that, a, in a sense, saying that self-magnetization is connected with self-gestation? In other ah. words, see what I'm saying? You're doing yes. this to gestate something that thought can then create like a manasa rupa, can create a finer body that is hard to do if karma is too active. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Just Gest the last phrase. Yeah, gestation. Self-gestation. Yes. Because one has to, what one is doing is kind of creating a magnetic sphere that allows you to gestate something. 
this kind of self-creation, a new kind of self-creation, um, giving you're giving birth to a new consciousness vesture. Is that a possible meaning? Well, yes, I, I think absolutely it is. And it gives sense to St. Paul's statement that we put off the old man and put on the new. Mm, yes, yes, yes. It makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. That is a connection. Yeah. But that is profound. I mean, that, and in a sense, everyone has to practice this anyway. I remember once mentioning about Hindu pollution in one of my classes. And a student, a couple of students, oh, come on, that's a silly idea. Of, you know, oh, it's it's all bad. I said, really? I said, I understand that, the abuse of, you know, I understand that point. But let me ask you a question. You're sitting down in a, a detective's office, and you're you're uh, you're you are hearing a a man being questioned who it's very apparent that person has been a terrible murderer. Okay. And he has a glass of water there, and you he sees you're thirsty. Would you drink his glass of water after he's been drinking out of it? And they said, no. I said, then you have a notion of moral pollution. Mm. Mm. Would you That's drink water wonderful from a glass example. with someone who had done several murders, had just been drinking out of it, mm -hmm. and you were terribly thirsty? You'd probably say no. So... Yeah. We do have this idea of self pollution. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Another question, Elton. Yes. What about group pollution and group study? Um, since we talk, we're talking about self magnetization, but. Is there, isn't there uh, an importance also to the groups that we choose to study with, the books that we choose to study, and so on? Almost everything we touch, we magnetize or is has been magnetized. Yeah, no, I think absolutely so. Um, I'm thinking William Quam Judge saying, you know, a group, so to speak, is only as strong as its weakest link. And I think there he's referring to a lot more than just the intellectual levels of the people involved, but it deals with motive and I think it deals with magnetization. Um, and which is why he often talked about each student of theosophy being a center very self-consciously trying to right, hold the higher in consciousness and be strong with all the others to help them do that and I think that's what we've shown just at the very physical level by that uh, experiment in the 70s of generating an electromagnetic field in a group of people, you know, just at that very low level, yes, it has an effect. So you can imagine how much more the effect is when we start talking about levels of consciousness and so on. Thank you, Kim. I was wondering if you could speak to the idea of um, the importance of studying mathematics and what we're what I'm getting at is in geometry and simple constructions with a straight edge and approach and a sorry a compass, one could construct you know a line a point a line a circle from that an equilateral triangle from that a pentagon and then one could understand perhaps and explore the ratios the golden ratio the you know diameter and pi there's so much richness and integrity to a real solid understanding of geometry that has an analogy, it seems, to the moral life and and uh, deep integrity and the power that comes from integrity. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Would 
we should probably let Pythagoras do that, but <laughs> and Plato. Well, if you think looking at like the secret doctrine, as well as some of her articles, um, HPB made constant reference, especially to geometry, like you just did, uh, to discuss all sorts of things, some of them fairly esoteric, um, because to use the, the old phrase, God geometrizes, and hence the notion of, you know, the seven principles, the 49 fires, the triad, uh, the one life. Um, so it seems like, yes, that would pervade everything and studying mathematics certainly would not be a harmful activity. In fact, HPB refers on occasion to meta-mathematics, but I can't pretend to say much about that. Thank you. Does, Jim, is that your hand up or is that from before? No, that's a, a new question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm becoming the pesky flyer. But here's the thing, Eldon. <laughs> I was thinking, um, Almost every tradition, religious tradition, philosophical tradition school, points out how critical speech is. Control of speech, purification of speech, the words we choose, the tones we use, the motive behind it. It seems to me, is it makes sense to say that um, the, the, the speech sound is vital to magnetization. And it's almost why, why, if that's the case, and that's my question, how vital is the how vital is the purity of speech connected with purification and magnetization? Um, that's one, one, one question. And is there a sense in which if you have a pure heart on an occasion for a person and you speak a certain way, it actually protects them in some way. It's like it's like generating a veil of protection on that person who needs some kind of being kind of enveloped in warmth. Well, we can do it with words, which can convey beautiful feelings. And really, there's a kind of magnetization that takes place, doesn't it? Oh, I think so. Um... <clears throat> We tend to associate speech with vibration. Mm -hmm. And in the secret doctrine, HPB refers to the uh, ancient Hindu concept of four levels of speech um, and often refers to the word, um, which is kind of the first manifest level of speech down to <clears throat> the speech that we use in talking to one another. Um, and electromagnetism has to do with vibration. <clears throat> so one could say, and, and if you think about it, it's, it's interesting. When a person speaks, if we pay attention, we often learn much more than actually they intended to convey about their thoughts because of the way they speak. And knowing that, then everything you said about speech, uh, its beneficent use, and even forming a kind of protection or at least support for uh, another person makes perfectly good sense, it seems to me. So I very much like the way you put that. Thank you, Alton. Robert, and then David. Uh, if we think of just a simple idea of a magnet, you can pick up things with a magnet. Uh, you can manipulate things with magnets. 
So when we talk about uh, the lower nature being magnetized by the upper, uh, are we talking about, about ascent and descent? In other words, like you talked about purification, which is kind of like the ascent of manas, lower manas, but at the same time, the magnetism doesn't imply a descent in, um, in some sense, uh, taking control over the material nature? Yes, I think so. Uh, <clears throat> it reorganizes the field it affects. And in in K and, and what the voice is talking about is a reorganization that then uplifts everything around it, um, including the whole of nature as well as other people. Um, so there's that. Remember, Heraclitus said. The way up and the way down is the same. So, uh, David. Oh, okay, thanks. Oh, uh, first, just in reference to uh, uh, Jim's question and comment, uh, there's a. I think the article is called "Those Messengers Called Words" by Judge, which is a very good article dealing with language and words. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if you could talk about um, uh, applying the idea of magnetism to the uh, to the saying that when we call for the light, we also call for the darkness. If that has any, you know, kind of connection to what we're discussing tonight, what we attract by how we polarize ourselves, yeah, and sure. the duality yeah. of things, yeah. Well, I think that's connected to the idea that when we really aspire to something, some form of self-reform, everything that has been attracted to us in the past is going to resist that right down to the elementals. We have attracted a zillion life forms to ourselves. Um, <clears throat> they're not ready for that change. And so of course they're there. And one way this is sometimes put is the brighter the light, the stronger the shadow. You know, on a hazy day, things hardly cast shadows at all. But when the sunlight is out and it's bright, the shadows are quite distinctive. Uh, and that seems to make perfectly good sense, which is why we have to purify, which means we have to, in transforming ourselves, we cannot be help but be trans helping all those life forms, either to leave and find other shadowy spots to be, or to become more luminous themselves. Anybody who's ever made a resolve knows almost instantly. <laughs> it looks like an obstacle appears. And I, I like that image of Ganesha, who we often think of as beneficent, which he is, the remover of obstacles. But his other name is the placer of obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, and we wouldn't learn anything if we couldn't do that. If all we had to do was just start <clears throat> thinking about the whole of humanity. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be a path, path, it would be a free pass. 
no, we have to <clears throat> thread our way through all of that. Um, and that's what treading the path is all about. Hence the portals and all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Dude, that reminds yeah, me. Are you familiar with that novel that came out, I think, in the 20s, uh, Mount Analog by Rene Domal? I'm not, no. It's a, it's a story. These people, each for their own reasons, discover that there is an island on no map. And they go to find this island. And others have gone before, and they find the island. And Mount Analog, obviously analogy, sits on the island. And the whole aim is to climb the mountain to the top. And they make two discoveries. One is that a lot of people get all caught up in the shops and taverns at the base of the mountain and never start the climb. The other start the climb and make the discovery that if they go up a link, say from one camp to the next, they cannot continue further on until they go back and bring somebody up to that camp with them. Then they can go to the next camp. And then they have to come back and bring somebody up to the next camp. I think that's a wonderful analogy to kind of what the whole path is about. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, a, a question about the weather. <laughs> it seems like the weather has been um, so extreme. Is there somehow that we can magnetize the planet, the weather, our journey? Is it too late for us? Or <laughs> I don't recall Raghavan Iyer ever saying it's too late. He often said, you have to change the way you look at things. Um, one of the beautiful ways I think he put it was, yes, this is Kali Yuga. And as Kali Yuga, it doubtless will get, after all, we're starting the second 5,000 year part of what may be 432,000 years long. But that to a person who has some development of consciousness, actually the golden age, Kriti Yuga, can be right here for them. The question is, what do we see when we look at things? You know, if you listen to CNN all day long, what you see is every terrible thing that's happening on the face of the planet, and there's plenty of it. But once in a while, something peeks through. What somebody is doing here, what a group is doing there. Um, at the Parliament of Religions that we were talking about before we began the formal part of this uh, session, finding these people with ideas very similar to ours, aspirations very similar to ours, uh, is just one of the things that one can see. Part of that golden age for this student uh, and the joy of it is the way we all had to go to Zoom to keep connected with one another and then discovering these connections could be much broader than we ever had before. Going to our local group um, is wonderful. But now we connect with people all over uh, the world at different times. I mean, right here, you're in New York. This is in California. Uh, I think that just it's how you look at things. 
what do you choose to see? And we do choose to see. When you're driving a car, there's a lot you don't pay attention to or shouldn't. You pay attention to the road and the traffic uh, and pedestrians. What do you see just in everyday life as you look? Do you see the aspirations that people have, the little goods that they do, sometimes the big goods they do? Or do we see every fault and flaw and limitation uh, that humans invariably have? Just interesting. I just wanted to read that a few people are thanking you, such as Liz Seth, who says um, this presentation was very inspirational. And Robert, wonderful ambiance and magnetism to your presentation. And Percy B. Munshi, thanks for the wonderful presentation I have in that leaving a bit early. But and also, thank you. This is really wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I kind of have to go too. I have some obligations here I need to take care of. Okay. So, th so we'll end on that, <laughs> on that note that it's time. And so we'll see you next week um, on the Aquarian. Uh, hope to see you there. Everybody stay safe and well. Uh, until next week, many blessings. Thank you again. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you.